Hello again. So we are going to talk about myositis here, and myositis uh, has many different causes. We're only going to talk about one class of those causes. There are other causes that includes infectious, which is usually a sudden onset of, uh, of muscle pain and weakness. Those include staph aureus, which is a post-surgery, post-trauma cause, immunocompromised, uh, but like I said, usually it is associated after penetrating trauma or surgery. Trichinosis is a disease caused by Trichinella spiralis, which is associated with undercooked pork. We generally don't see this in the U.S. Lyme disease can have muscle pain and weakness uh, in addition to the joint pain, and then toxoplasma and cryptococcus are uh, going to be in immunocompromised patients. There are drugs that can cause myositis. The one that you should be most familiar with are the statins, HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors. That is, uh, muscle pain or weakness is a definite, absolute contraindication to uh, statin use. So if you've got that in a patient, you should discontinue use. Phenytoin, hydralazine, ACE inhibitors, and the anti-HIV drug zidovudine are also associated with possible myositis. We're going to talk about the idiopathic causes of myositis, which are not so idiopathic that we don't know why they're caused. We know they're autoimmune in origin, um, with the exception of the third one we're going to talk about. But uh, they're idiopathic in as much as um, we really don't know uh, exactly how to treat them other than immunosuppressants. So these are slow onset and progressive, so they're not going to be something that the patient just suddenly comes in with a two-day history. It's going to be something with two, a two or three month history at least. So there are three causes of myositis you need to be familiar with, and I'll tell you what those are in a little bit. Um, so, as I mentioned, these are all idiopathic, autoimmune, and inflammatory diseases of the skeletal muscle. Occasionally, they can affect the cardiac muscle, but generally, they're going to be focused on the skeletal muscle. It is relatively rare. It only affects uh, around one to eight people per million in the U.S., so these are quite rare diseases. So the first two diseases are polymyositis and dermatomyositis. And in polymyositis and dermatomyositis, they're very similar diseases. Uh, women, uh, women are affected more than men by about a two to one ratio. Blacks are affected more than whites by a five to eight to one ratio. And so that lends some credibility to the fact that this could be a uh, genetic disorder. For inclusion body myositis, men are affected more than women, so that's different. And you're going to see that inclusion body myositis is really a separate entity. Poly and dermatomyositis are very similar. Inclusion body myositis is quite different. The age of onset is around 45 to 60 years, so like around retirement age. You're going to see this come up in your uh, older middle-aged patients. And there is an increased incidence of the idiopathic myositis with other autoimmune diseases. So patients who have Sjogren's syndrome, scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, they're at increased risk for myositis, particularly polymyositis and dermatomyositis. The best first step if you are suspecting polymyositis or dermatomyositis is going to be CPK and Eldolase, which are specific, uh, well, they're... I wouldn't say necessarily specific, but they're, uh, they're very indicative of muscle inflammation. The most accurate test, however, is going to be biopsy, and that's going to be necessary to establish the specific diagnosis. Okay, so the idiopathic myositis, as you probably have gathered, we're going to talk about polymyositis, dermatomyositis, and inclusion body myositis. So polymyositis is idiopathic, autoimmune, and inflammatory, idiopathic, and as much as we don't know exactly the mechanism, but we have a general, uh, generally good idea that it's autoimmune in origin, uh, and it's inflammatory, meaning that white blood cells are recruited to the muscle, and that's causing inflammatory style pain. It affects the proximal muscles much more dramatically than the distal muscles. So this is going to be something that affects the thighs and the upper arms and the hips uh, rather than the fingers and the hands and the uh, feet. 
and it, and it definitely uh, does not affect the facial or ocular muscles. Ocular muscles are absolutely never involved in polymyositis. The symptoms the patient's going to present with is progressive weakness. A lot of times the patient are, is going to present complaining of problems with the activities of daily life, and that's because the proximal muscles are involved. Now, if you've ever gone and worked out, done a really big workout, and you've used your arms, uh, like if you've moved or something, moved a bunch of heavy objects, and you get that really, really heavy sensation in your arms to the point where you might not even be able to lift them up very high. That is uh, basically how these patients feel all the time. So they have hard, a hard time lifting their arms up. That's going to make it difficult for women to brush their hair or uh, to get out of a chair or to carry objects uh, or even holding their head up. They may even have uh, neck weakness. So uh, you can see that these are proximal problems. Um, they're not going to have trouble writing. They're not going to have trouble uh, manipulating with their hands. It's, it's going to be uh, mostly with the arms and the legs. Now, the holding the head up is another thing. Not so much, uh, that's, that's more of a, uh, of a more long-term effect uh, as, the, as this disease progresses. That's not so much something that a patient is going to present with as often, but be aware that it can be uh, an effect. The neck muscles can be affected. Another thing that can occur with polymyositis is dysphagia. So often due to the inflammatory nature, the symptoms are going to be worse in the morning and they'll improve throughout the day. What does that sound like? That sounds like rheumatoid arthritis. Why? Because rheumatoid arthritis is inflammatory. Inflammatory diseases, the symptoms tend to be worse in the morning. And then as the day progresses, because you're moving things around, the inflammation drains and the symptoms improve. Constitutional symptoms may be present, fatigue, weakness, those are what we associate when we think of constitutional symptoms. Of course, weakness is going to be in polymyositis no matter what, but patients could also have uh, fever as well. As mentioned, polymyositis is associated with other autoimmune disorders, and for diagnosis, when you suspect polymyositis based on the patient's history and the vignette, uh, the best first step is going to be getting a CPK and aldolase levels. In many patients, the CPK is going to be 6 to 12 times the reference range, so that is pretty obvious when you see that CPK come back. And these are, as I mentioned, markers for muscle inflammation. To establish the diagnosis and begin treatment, however, you are going to need to get a muscle biopsy. And that is absolutely necessary. You cannot make the diagnosis based on the CPK and aldolase alone. So you have to get a muscle biopsy to establish the diagnosis. Once you've gotten that muscle biopsy, the best treatment for polymyositis is corticosteroids. And generally, we use oral prednisone. Now, if corticosteroids alone are not effective, you can use cytotoxic or biologics. So methotrexate, uh, um, even uh, Enbrel, uh, Infliximab are all uh, effective against polymyositis. However, prednisone is the best drug. It's the best first drug to use, and so that's going to be your answer on the USMLE. The prognosis for polymyositis is good. Uh, the major complications are dysphagia, which can be uh, more of a, uh, which is usually more of a, uh, of an annoying factor for the patient. Not so much uh, going to be uh, cause real health problems, and then interstitial lung disease, which can actually cause some significant health problems. There is an association of interstitial lung disease with polymyositis and dermatomyositis, and therefore. In any patient you diagnose polymyositis and dermatomyositis, you're going to want to get titers for the antibody anti-JO1. And what anti-JO1 is, is it's an antibody, but it's an antibody that will tell you that the patient has an increased risk to develop interstitial lung disease in association with their myositis. So after you've diagnosed the patient with polymyositis, anti-JO1 is good to get because it tells you if the patient is at higher risk to develop interstitial lung disease. They don't need to be anti-JO1 positive, 
to, de to develop interstitial lung disease. And if they are anti-JO1 positive, it doesn't mean they're necessarily going to develop interstitial lung disease, but it's good to have that just to know. Anti-JO1 is not diagnostic for polymyositis. So that's not the test you're going to order to make a definitive diagnosis of polymyositis. Remember, you're going to get your CPK and elder lace levels first, and then you're going to move on to get your muscle biopsy for a definitive diagnosis. Okay, how about dermatomyositis? This is just like polymyositis. As a matter of fact, I would like to call this disease dermatopolymyositis. Why? Because it's polymyositis just with an extra symptom. So this is an idiopathic autoimmune inflammatory condition just like polymyositis. However, in addition to polymyositis, dermatomyositis affects the skin. So you've got the same muscular symptoms as polymyositis. It affects the proximal muscles most dramatically. It's symmetrical. Distal muscles are relatively cons conserved and ocular muscles are never involved. The symptoms are gonna be the same as polymyositis. It's going to be progressive. Proximal weakness, difficulty with activities of daily life, worse in the morning, constitu constitutional symptoms may be present. However, what distinguishes dermatomyositis from polymyositis is the skin symptoms. In dermatomyositis, you're going to have the characteristic heliotrope rash. And what that is, is it's just like a sunburn looking rash, and it occurs on the face, the eyelids, and the sun exposed areas. You can also get a rash, uh, just a sort of a red, dark looking rash on the knuckles and on the over the PIP and DIP joints of the hand. And that's called Gatron's rash. You can also get little nodules on, uh, on those joints and that's called Gatron's papules. We'll take a look at what those look like. Just like polymyositis, dermatomyositis is associated with other autoimmune disorders. And just like polymyositis, the way we uh, the way we diagnose this is the exact same. You get your CPK and elder lace levels, and the most accurate test is muscle biopsy. The only thing that differentiates dermatomyositis from polymyositis is the rash. So here's the heliotrope rash. It, uh, in this patient, it's a little uh, it, it's a, a little inconspicuous, I would say. But you got some uh, what looks like kind of looks like a sunburn, flushing, but it's it's only over the eyelids and uh, like the cheeks and the chin with some sparing over the forehead. And you can see that in this patient too. Uh, then you can see that it also occurs in sun exposed areas. So you can see that this woman was you know, wearing a, uh, like a, a low neck shirt. And so there's sparing over the areas that was covered and the rash is occurring over the, uh, over the exposed areas. And this is obviously not a sunburn. So this rash would, in addition to the muscular symptoms, make you think dermatomyositis over polymyositis. This is Gatron's rash and papules. So this is another very uh, specific thing to dermatomyositis. So you can see that there's uh, some skin thickening and redness over the uh, knuckles and the DIP and PIP joints. And uh, it's the same in this patient of color. It's not red, but it's darker. And uh, here you can see uh, the papules right here and right here. The distribution of muscles in polymyositis and dermatomyositis are the same. So it's going to be uh, muscles of the, uh, of the hip girdle, of the thigh, of the upper arm, and uh, the neck and shoulders. So as far as treatment for dermatomyositis, after you diagnose it, it's the exact same treatment as for polymyositis. So even though it's a different disorder, dermatomyositis, it's the exact same treatment, prednisone. You can add cytotoxics or biologics if prednisone is not effective alone, but the, the best drug initially is prednisone. Prognosis is good. Dysphagia and interstitial lung disease are the major complications, just like polymyositis. And anti jo one is good to get. Uh, order that in patients uh, with polymyositis or dermatomyositis because that's a risk factor for interstitial lung disease. Okay. So as a side note, uh, and I didn't know really where to fit this in, so I just decided to put it in right here. Uh, when you're assessing weakness, myositis might not be the first thing that comes to mind, and that makes perfect sense because, like I mentioned, it's one to eight 
per million people in the U.S., so it is rarer. So there's a wide differential for weakness. As far as labs, there are many things that you want to order, and this is more of a for uh, real life uh, purposes. But uh, if you're really thinking myositis, dermatomyositis, polymyositis, uh, then you're going to want to get CPK and elderly. So that's going to be the best uh, test. But other tests you might want to have in mind are uh, a metabolic profile to look for electrolyte abnormalities, namely uh, sodium, potassium, calcium are going to be associated with weakness. CBC can show infection or anemia. That's going to be associated with weakness. ANA and rheumatoid factors will be associated with autoimmune disorders, which can cause weakness. Uh, hypothyroidism can cause weakness, so getting a thyroid function test uh, can be useful, and then vitamin D levels, which can indicate a calcium deficiency or indicate the cause of calcium deficiency. So those are all labs that may be of use in a patient with quote-unquote weakness. The differential for weakness, uh, and this is not a complete differential, but it's uh, some of the things that come up a lot on USMLE. Electrolyte anomalies, that's a big one namely potassium and calcium. Myasthenia gravis. Now, how do we differentiate myasthenia gravis from the myositis? Myasthenia gravis affects the facial muscles most prominently, and it also affects the ocular muscles. So you can get uh, eye drop in myasthenia gravis. So that's the way I want you to think of myasthenia gravis. It's a nerve disorder. Um, an acetylcholine uh, receptor disorder. So this is something uh, that's much different from the myositis in that it affects facial muscles most dominantly. Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome is similar to myasthenia gravis, uh, but it uh, generally occurs uh, in the presence of cancer. Muscular dystrophy is going to be a wrong answer if the uh, right answer is myositis, just because muscular dystrophy is generally a pediatric disorder, and myositis is an older patient disorder. Uh, Drug-induced myositis, the only thing I can tell you for this is to read your patient's drug list. Uh, the USMLE will give you a list of drugs if that's what they want you to think. Infectious myositis is going to be a more acute onset, higher fever, as I mentioned earlier. And then polymyalgia rheumatica is highlighted by pain. Polymyositis and dermatomyositis is highlighted by weakness. Uh, it's not a pain disorder. Actually, only about one-third of patients with poly and dermatomyositis complain of pain. Uh, whereas polymyo poly polymyalgia rheumatica, look at the word there, myalgia. That means muscle pain. So this is highlighted by pain. Okay, inclusion body myositis. This is sort of a uh, the black sheep of the three. So this can be hereditary or it can be acquired. It is inflammatory, uh, but uh, the main difference here are the uh, symptom distribution and the pathology. So the mechanism is absolutely unclear and controversial. I am not even going to speculate on the mechanism. It is highly complex, uh, the theories that are out there. If you want to go look, look it up, you have my blessing, but I guarantee you the USMLE will not expect you to know anything about the mechanism behind this disorder. So unlike polymyositis and dermatomyositis, so what separates this apart from those two diseases, which are very similar, Inclusion body myositis can be asymmetrical, whereas poly and dermatomyositis are symmetrical uh, in the weakness distribution. Poly my, er, inclusion body myositis can affect distal muscles just as prominently as, as proximal muscles, so they may have difficulty with manipulation, they may have difficulty opening a can, uh, and more notably, inclusion body myositis happens more in men than in women. The symptoms of inclusion body myositis can be in some ways similar to poly and dermatomyositis, but in many ways different. It, in, in similarity, is it is an insidious weakness. They can have dysphagia, and they can have proximal weakness, but contrary to poly and dermatomyositis, it is asymmetrical, and they can have proximal weakness. They can also have droopy facial muscles too, but they never have ocular involvement. And that's something that links all three of these myositis together. They never have ocular involvement. 
the, the, the things that you should think of when you have ocular muscle weakness is myasthenia gravis and Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. Both of those are nerve disorders, not disorders of the muscle. On physical exam, inclusion body myositis could show up with decreased tendon reflexes. That's somewhat common. But for diagnosis, again, the CPK and LDLase are going to be the best initial diagnostic step and the most accurate test is going to be biopsy. Now, know that CPK and LDLase is the best initial step and the most accurate test is biopsy. But in between those two tests, you may be getting an electromusculogram. And the reason you may be getting uh, the EMG is because when you're getting the biopsy for inclusion body myositis, because it's asymmetric and because some muscles might be affected and other muscles might not, you want to know that you're getting the biopsy on a muscle that's affected. And so getting an EMG and seeing that it's abnormal is useful because then you'll know that that muscle is affected and then therefore you can get the biopsy there rather than hunting and pecking uh, for abnormal muscles. So the treatment for inclusion body myositis, unfortunately, uh, there's really no good treatment for this disease. It's refractory to steroids and immunosuppressants. So the treatment is going to be primarily supportive and geared towards improving the patient's functioning in daily life and coping with the symptoms. It is not a deadly disease, so even though this is progressive and it's a pain in the ass, it's not a deadly disease. Inclusion body myositis looks very similar in the early stages to amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or as it's called in the U.S., Lou Gehrig's disease. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, however, will progress and progress and progress. It will progress to paralysis. Inclusion body myositis does, never gets that bad. ALS will also progress to affect the respiratory muscles. Inclusion body, my, inclusion body myositis never gets that bad. ALS is fatal. So the definite differentiation between inclusion body myositis and ALS, at least in the early stages, is going to be with the muscle biopsy. You'll see quote unquote inclusion bodies in the muscle as well as inflammation. That's going to differentiate it from ALS. ALS, the muscles are totally normal. It's a nervous disorder. So that's why it's important to get that muscle biopsy because ultimately in the early stages of the disease that may be the only thing that's going to help you differentiate it from ALS, the abnormal muscle biopsy showing, uh, showing inclusion bodies. And I was tempted to put in a picture of what those inclusion bodies look like, but for step two and three, unlike for step one, you do not need to know what any pathology looks like. So just know that inclusion bodies vacuolated uh, uh, spaces in the muscle are present in inclusion body myositis. And that's the end.